All right, shalom, shalom, everybody. Welcome back, welcome back. Happy Shabbat. Hope you've been blessed. Hope you've been prayed up. Hope everybody been well during these times, man. All right, so today we're going to be getting into the history of the Akan people. Get into the, um, a little bit of their Hebrew history, a little bit of their migration, and just a little bit of their culture and how they ended up in Western Africa, right? So just before we get started, we're going to get the understanding that these people are found in the scriptures, all right? And to do that, we're going to be jumping to Joshua 7 and verse 1. Joshua 7 verse 1 tells us, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for a Chan or a Khan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah. All right. So a Khan was of the tribe of Judah. Joshua 15 verse 42 informs us as well that a Shan, a Shan was what? A dominion or a village of Judah. So we got a Khan, a son of Judah, a Shan, a village of Judah. Not only that, in Joshua um, chapter 19, we see you, we see in verses 6 through 8 that Ashan is also one of the villages of the tribe of Simeon. So these people are well in the scripture, but we're going to build upon that. Furthermore, we see that in the Strong's Concordance that Akan is the name of the Israelite. And it was talking about the same person in Joshua 7 and 1. We got it talked about again in Joshua 7 and 19, as well as Joshua 7 and um, 18. But we see that Akan is an Israelite, the name of Israelite and a son of Judah. So we got that foundation um, of them within the scripture. So let's build upon who they are. So. The Akan people are believed to have migrated to their current location from the Sahara and Sahel regions of Africa into the forest region around the 11th century. Many Akans tell their history as it started in the eastern region of Africa, as this is where the ethnogenesis of the Akan as we know it, excuse me, as we know them today happened. Or traditions of the ruling of Brande clan relate that the Akans originated from ancient Ghana. All right, not modern day Ghana, but ancient Ghana. They migrated from the north. They went through Egypt and settled in Nubia. Let me read that again, because they probably went over you all's head. They migrated from the north. They went through Egypt and settled in Nubia. All right, so let's think about this. Where do you migrate north from to go through Egypt and end up in Nubia. Hmm. Israel. Palestine. The so-called Middle East. So these people. The Akan. Alright. The children of Judah. They migrated from Israel. And went through Egypt. And settled in Nubia. Alright. The only place north of Egypt is Israel. Alright. But around 500 AD. Due to pressure exerted. On Nubia, by the Aksumite Empire of Ethiopia, Nubia was shattered, and the Akan people moved west and established small trading kingdoms. These kingdoms grew, and around 750 AD, the Ghana Empire was formed. All right. So after they moved west from Nubia, after um, it was shattered, they went into the Ghana Empire, which was formed around 750 AD. The empire lasted from 750 AD to 1200 AD and collapsed as a result of the introduction of Islam into Western Sudan and the zeal of the Muslims to impose their religion. Their ancestors eventually left for Kong. All right, so they left for Kong, which is present day Ivory Coast. From Kong, they moved to Wam and then to Dorma. The movement from Kong was necessitated by the desire of the people to find suitable savanna conditions since they were not used to the forest life. Around the 14th century, they moved from Dorma southeastwards to Twifo Himang, northwest Cape Coast, all right? This move was commercially motivated. The kingdom of Bonomai was established as early as the 12th century. Between the 12th century, excuse me, between the 12th and 13th centuries, a gold boom in the area 
brought wealth to numerous of cons. During different phases of the kingdom of Bonamon, groups of Akan migrated out of the area to create numerous states based predominantly on gold mining and trading of cash crops. This brought wealth and numerous of excuse me, this brought wealth to numerous of Akan states, such as the Aquamo Empire, and ultimately led to the rise of the well known Akan Empire, the Empire of Ashanti the most dominant of the Akan states. All right, so we got their oral traditions out the way. So we see they migrated from Israel, or let me just um say it the way they said it. Excuse me, the way Wikipedia said it. They migrated from the north, all right, which we know is Israel. They went through Egypt and settled in Nubia, all right? So this is the oral history that the forefathers is passing down, all right? So... We're going to continue to build upon this. And to do that, we're going to jump to Hebrewisms of Western Africa. And we're just going to gain this general understanding that the Ashantis and all these other clans of the Akan people were once all together. All right. They were once all just known as the Akan. But it says the general sum of these traditions is that the Fontis, the Ashantis, and the Wasawa, and in fact, all the Twi speaking or Akan peoples were originally one tribe, all right? They were a pastoral race and inhabited the open country beyond the forest belt and farther north than Sagaga. Excuse me, Salagag, a north, a northern and lighter skinned people, which is commonly supposed to have been the Fulanis, commerce to in encroach on their territory and being stronger than they seized their cattle and young women and made many of them slaves after a time the cons began to migrate in small parties into the forest where they built little villages and lived in hiding as time went on the numbers of these forest dwelling fugitives increased until in the course of many years their numbers became very considerable the oppressors then heard of them and made several attempts to conquer and enslave them, but were unable to fight in the defense of the forest, and tiring of their want of success eventually left them unmolested. All right. Living in peace, the people continue to increase and gradually extend further south until they had populated the forest belt and eventually reached the coast. All right. So this is um basically what happened after the fall of the Empire of Ghana. Um they started migrating down, started living in the, the um forest, started getting attacked by the Fulanis, this and that. Eventually started to branch off into different clans and tribes and live peacefully on the coast, as it was said. All right, that was until the slave trade came. <laughs> but let's continue on. I'm gonna start up top. It says so now we're about to start to get um understanding of, you know, the Shanti name and all that stuff. But by the present writer, then the most that is suggested is that not a few Hebrew words and possible certain distinctive Hebrew conjunctions have been incrited on the native language of the Shanti. Moreover, if some scholars find similarities between the Sumerian of early Babylon, Babylonia, and modern African languages, why should we be surprised at apparent traces of Hebrew in the Ashanti language of today? The very name Ashanti has itself a strong Hebraic flavor. All right, we just read that Ashan was up was what a city of Judah. So they letting you know right there, basically confirming the fact that. Ashan is a Hebrew word or Shanti by them saying that itself has a strong Hebraic flavor. But let's continue. It says for a while some of it says for a while some will derive the word from Shan, the name of a plant and the tea to eat, claiming that the title must have been acquired in the time of a great famine when they found substance in the plant in question. This is mere guesswork. Actually, determination T or T in the names of West African tribes has usually the general meaning of the race of, the man of, the children of. This will make Ashanti the people of Ashan. All right, Joshua 15. There was of eight. There was, in fact, 
a town of the name of Ashan in the dominion of Judah, all right, which we are to brought out. So Ashanti means the people of Ashan. Furthermore, the primary meaning of the Hebrew word Ashan, so they let you know that Ashan is a Hebrew word, is smoke. So Ashan in Hebrew means smoke, and it is primarily used of a burning city. And, and secondly, figuratively, of the destruction of Israel. The later meaning would be significant and certainly applicable to fugitives from the destroyers of Jerusalem, whether they were the Assyrians or the Romans. All right, so the name Ashanti or Ashan will be applied to fugitives, all right, or descendants of Ashan. Furthermore, Now, on the one hand, we have no less an authority than Professor Albert T. Clay of Yale University that some Semites use M and others W to represent the same sound. All right. Some use M, some use W to represent the same sound. And on the, um, and on the other hand, Captain Richeri asserts me that the Ashanti the letter M interchanges with W and quotes Cristala as confirmatory authority. So within the Ashanti language, you have the M being able to interchange with the W as well. So this will establish a surprising similarity between the, Ash between the Ashanti Yame and the Hebrew Tetragrammaton Yahweh. All right. So if you was to reverse the um, M, and turns it into a W, like it said within the Ashanti language, the name of their Elohim or the God that they worship will indeed be the same Elohim of the scriptures. And they will call him what? Yahweh. Change the N with the W, be Yahweh. It's that simple. Furthermore, among the attributes of the Ashanti in Yame stands out Bor Bor, meaning creator, the exact equivalent in sound and significance with the principle Bor of the Hebrew verb Bora to create. Again, in Yame, it's called Nyakapon, signifying Nyame alone, great one, and Nyakapon Kwam, which means Nyame alone, great one, to whom Saturday is dedicated, which is assuredly. And easily equivalent for the Lord of the Sabbath. All right. So we see that the Ashanti or the Akans, shall I say, 100% worship the God of the Father. I mean, excuse me, 100% worship the Elohim of the Scripture. So we see the correlations. We see the oral history. We see it through what they call the Father. All right, but we're going to continue to build. I'm going to get into a little bit of their customs. It says, we are informed by Wallace Budge that from early dynastic times, dancing formed an intimate part in the religious functions of the Egyptians. The children of Israel carried this custom with them in their migration from Egypt. And we find it recorded in the Holy Writ that when the Ark of the Lord was removed from the house of Abinadon, the Gittite, to be brought into the holy city, King David danced with all his might before the Lord. And David was girded with a linen ephod. Now we know we, as black people, we know we as so-called African Americans, we love to dance, all right? But where do we get this trait from? Where do we get this from, all right? Where do we get this custom from? We got it from our ancestors who brought it to Western Africa, but where did they get it from? We're going to continue to read and see. In this connection, Edward Scott's remarks, among the Jews, among the Jews, and dancing was always regarded as a becoming expression of religious fever and joyful emotions. All right. Even when we in church, even when we was in Sunday church, we used to see all the, all the old women. All right. Dancing and going crazy all the time. So dancing is 100%. A part of our culture, and we know this from growing up. 
but we're going to take it back to some of the tribes back in Africa who actually incorporated this or passed this trait down from our ancestors, the Jews, our ancestors, the Israelites. The Jews in early times, like the Greeks and Egyptians, introduced dancing in all their great religious festivals. For instance, at the time, excuse me, for instance, at the festival of the first fruits, the whole population of a town would turn out. Furthermore, next page. In the same manner, dancing forms a very essential part of the Ashanti worship today. And we are told that the Ashanti dance invariably has a religious significance. All right. So the Ashanti dance also has a um, religious significance in it. So also we find in the Maya dance of the Jamaica bush and the fanaticism of the Mayalism as manifested in the digging up or pulling of bees, excuse me, or pulling of bees, as it is called. One of the strong indications of the Ashanti's dominance among the descendants of the slaves in the island and possible and possibly the survival of another Hebraic influence. All right. So this is why we like to dance, because <laughs> these are Hebraic influences. These are Hebraic traits. These are Hebraic things that our ancestors, right, brought with to Western Africa that we brought to the Americas. And we see this manifested through the Ashanti and the Mayal dance, all right? Now we're going to be jumping to Black Jews in Africa and the Americas. This is by um, Professor Tudor Tudor Parfit, all right? And it says... His Akan concept of God endeavored to demonstrate that the Akan had come to knowledge of the God of the Bible quite independently. All right. So the Akan knew knowledge of the Bible, had knowledge of the Bible independently. All right. We know this was independent because they came from what Israel, they came from the north, went through Egypt, went through, went through Nubia, went west across the Sudan. All right, so of course they would have got it independently with them actually being descendants of Israel. But the Akan come to a knowledge of the God of the Bible quite independently of Western colonization, excuse me, of Western colonial influence. And that there in Yakapon Kwame or Kwam, the greater God of Saturday, was none other than the biblical Jehovah, as they call him, all right? A number of books have similar similar endeavors to show that the other Ghanaian groups are descended from the ancient Israel. All right, so this was just to bring out the fact that they understand that the Akan had came to knowledge of the Elohim of the Bible independently of the Western colonial influences. So this is important because people like to say, oh, the white man. Brought you all knowledge of the scripture. The white man did this. The white man did that. No, no, no. This was an understanding. This was a heritage. This was knowledge passed down from the migration out of Israel to the migration to West Africa. That's why you, st because these are Hebraic traits that have been with us since the beginning of our migration. So the Akan came to knowledge of the Bible. But of the Elohim and Yakupon Kawam, right? The greater God of Saturday. All right, happy Shabbat, family, because that's what it is. And that's crazy. We reading this um about what the Akan, the words the Akan used to refer to the Father. And Yakupon Kawam, the greater God of Saturday or of the Shabbat. But let's continue next. Furthermore. We go on, it says, the reviewer of Williams' work in the respected journal of the Royal African Society was hesitant about the purported connection between the Ashanti and Hebrew, as in the Paris in Yame and Yahweh, in Torah and Torah, but was not adverse to the overall thesis. The reviewer recognized that the Ashanti inland tribes had many of those Semitic traits which the Ashanti also exhibit. But whether in addition, their ruling class, which probably also influenced the Akan stocks, 
were Jews from Palestine. So let me just correct that right there, because what we already know is that the Ashanti came from the Akan. So it wasn't the Ashanti who was influencing the Akan. It was the Akan who were the original Jews from Palestine who influenced the rest of their children or the rest of their clans to keep on the Hebraic traditions, such as the Ashanti. All right. So. If the Ashanti came from the Akan, the Ashanti could not have influenced the whole Akan nation. It was an influence from the Akan down to the Ashanti, down to the Fante, right? Down to the Akwamu, down to their other clans. All right. All right. But furthermore, we're going to continue to go ahead and bring out some information on these people. And to do that, we're going to go to recasting the past. All right. And we're about to get ready and wrap it up. And it says, we're going to start up here. Okay. Okwam Osi, short book, The Ancient Egyptians Are Here, was published in Koamasi in 2001 and sold well. Osi, a linguistic graduate from Ashanti and Fodasi, argues that Akan people helped build the pyramids and Jerusalem and that they carried their gods, Amu and Yahweh, with them to Western Africa. All right, let me read that again. They argues that the Khan people helped build the pyramids of Jerusalem and that they carried the gods Amun and Yahweh with them to Western Africa. And this can be found within the book, The Ancient Egyptians Are Here. All right, that is important. And it goes right with the oral traditions of the Akan, letting us know that they came from the north. They spent a little time in Egypt, all right, before they went to Nubia and migrated west across to Western Africa, all right? Furthermore, we're going to read from the top. It says, for his own purpose, O.C. Agiman, Pompey II, all right, which is a king or a king of the Ashanti, in 1946, he explained his views to his drafting committee in comments of chapter one. So this is from a book of Asi Agman, Pompey II, the king of the Ashanti. And this is what he had to say. This last work about migrations from, excuse me, this last work about migrations of ancient Ashantis to the Gold Coast is a finish to the work so long delayed. I thank you. It is a fitting thing to go back to the earliest times. It shows what has always been my opinion that the Ashantis is ancient and venerable back from when history is remembered. I know it truly to be the fact that in ancient past, the Ashanti people lived by Jerusalem and removed little by little to live again in Egypt, and then here. All right, so let me read that again. And this is according to Asi Agman, Pompey II, all right, one of the kings of the Ashanti. He said himself, I know it truly to be the fact that in the ancient past, the Ashanti people lived by Jerusalem and removed little by little to live again in Egypt, then to here, all right? Now, we done brought out a little bit of their history, a little bit of their culture, you know, a little bit of their Hebraic traits. But let's hear it from the horse's mouth themselves. Let's see what an Ashanti has to say about who they are and their all or traditions. These things that we are doing here. So, in short, the Ashantis originated from Judah. We were attacked by the Romans, by Alexander the Great, Joan of Arc. Then we came to Egypt. When we came to Egypt also, we were being attacked by these Muslims and these groups. Then we migrated to Old Ghana Empire. When we came to Old Ghana Empire, then we have Songha, Songha Empire also. That is the present day Mali. 
that is where we were living before we came to now Ghana. There also we were being attacked. And we, when we left Egypt, we came to present day Mali with our knowledge. And the first ever university to be on earth was in Mali, Timbuktu. And with that, I say shalom, shalom, family. Told off for watching, told off for viewing. I hope it was edifying. And like the brother said, they came from Jerusalem. They came from Judah. All right. He verified everything we went through over this short little video. All right. We brought out the scriptures. We brought out the sources and we brought out the oral traditions. All right. The Akan people are from Judea. All right. They are African Semitic peoples who found their way into Western Africa. And we brought out the history of all that. So I would just like to say, told out for watching, stay tuned in as we continue to bring these short videos out of our people and their migrations to West Africa.